Welcome to the special presentation by the Office of the President and the Faculties of Arts and Education at the University of Alberta. My name is Yars Balan, and I'm the director of the Peter and Doris Kuhl Ukrainian Canadian Studies Center at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. CIUS, in partnership with its Holodomor Research and Education Consortium and the Kuhl Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of Alberta, is honored to have as our guest Anne Applebaum, the author of Red Famine, Stalin's War Against Ukraine, who is joining us virtually from her home in Warsaw, Poland. Traditionally, the Ukrainian community of Edmonton gathers each year at an event organized by the Ukrainian Canadian Congress on the fourth Saturday of November to hold a solemn memorial service or panacheda honoring the victims of the artificial famine of 1932-1933. Known in Ukrainian as the whole of the Mor, or to kill by hunger, the famine was the result of Soviet government policies that led to the deliberate starvation and outright murder of millions of innocent citizens of then communist Ukraine in one of the 20th century's greatest crimes against humanity. The event also traditionally includes a keynote talk on the subject of the famine, as well as remarks by community leaders and officials from all three levels of government. This year, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, this digital presentation titled Stalin's War on Ukraine a conversation with Anne Applebaum, author of Red Famine, is being broadcast at the same time that hundreds of Ukrainian Edmontonians would normally be congregating in the large and airy lobby area of Edmonton City Hall, the site of the first public memorial erected in remembrance of the Holodomor. I will now ask Marta Bezuk, the Executive Director of the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium, to introduce our speaker and to initiate our conversation with her. Thank you, Yars. It's my pleasure to be introducing Anne Applebaum. Anne Applebaum is a staff writer for The Atlantic and a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. She's also a senior fellow of international affairs and Agora fellow in residence at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. A Washington Post columnist for 15 years and a former member of the editorial board, Anne has also worked as the foreign and deputy editor of The Spectator magazine in London. Red Famine, Stalin's War in Ukraine was published in October 2017, and it received the Lionel Gelber Prize as well as the Duff Cooper Prize. Her previous book, Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe 1944 to 1956, described the imposition of Soviet totalitarianism in Central Europe after the Second World War. Iron Curtain won the 2012 Kundal Prize for Historical Literature and the Duke of Westminster Medal. She's also the author of Gulag, A History, which narrates the history of the Soviet concentration camp system and describes daily life in the camps, making extensive use of recently opened Russian archives, as well as memoirs and interviews. Gulag won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 2004 and was also a National Book Award finalist. Iron Curtain, Gulag, and Red Famine have all appeared in more than two dozen translations, including all major European languages. Over the years, Anne Applebaum's writings have appeared in the New York Review of Books, The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, The Financial Times, The International Herald Tribune, Foreign Affairs, New Criterion, The Weekly Standard, The Guardian, Prospect, and I'm only reading half of the publications listed here. She has lectured at Yale, Harvard, Columbia University, as well as Oxford, Cambridge, University of Toronto, uh, and many, many others. In 2013, she held the Philippe Roman Chair of History and International Relations at the London School of Economics. And with that, uh, let's turn to our conversation. Anne, in the context of current events, you've written about the purpose of disinformation, that it's not to make us believe something in particular, but basically to make us believe that it's not possible to know the truth. Uh, are there lessons in the success of the Soviet disinformation campaign that we can learn from? The fact that for more than 50 years, the Holodomor was denied and that we still today encounter a narrative that it was an invention of disgruntled emigres. What can we learn? Or is it too much of a stretch to say there's anything to learn from that experience? No, I think there's a lot we can learn from that experience. Um, you know, look, the Holodomor was one of the greatest and most successful cover-ups of the 20th century. Um, it, was, it was an event that everybody knew about while it was unfolding at the time. And we have 
letters, for example, from prominent Bolsheviks writing to Stalin, describing things they were seeing through train windows. Um, Stalin had regular reports from the Ukrainian countryside and from the countryside and the rest of the Soviet Union, because of course there was hunger everywhere. Um, he had frequent and, and, and um, voluminous actually reports from the Ukrainian Communist Party, um, which were sufficient actually to worry him. One of the reasons why he launched a purge of the Ukrainian Communist Party kind of in, 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 in conjunction with the famine was that he was getting so much feedback about um, Ukrainian communists on the ground, you know, filled with horror at what they were seeing um, and writing to Moscow, to Kiev and to, and to Kharkov and to Moscow, um, asking for, you know, asking for relief. So this was a well-known story. It was, um, it was known both to people in Moscow, it was known to people all over the country. Um, it was of course known to people inside Ukraine. Um, and the, the way in which it was covered up, um, um, you know, is, is worth studying in and of itself. So um, it was first covered up through the threat of, I mean, literally arrest if you mentioned it or, or said anything about it, you would go to prison. I mean, it was, it was actually that simple. Um, it, you know, Ukrainian communists who, who, who brought it up risked being, you know, chucked out of the party. And in fact, most of them eventually were. The majority of people who were at the, in the party leadership at the time of the famine um, were either dead or in prison um, a decade later. Um, later on, it was forbidden to mention the famine, um, either the specific Ukrainian famine or the more general Soviet famine in any textbook or in any history book. And then most famously, um, Stalin actually changed the census. So the, the census that was carried out in 1937 was altered so that the, so that the missing people would not be evident to a later generation of of demographers. And, you know, these are all things that we know now and that we can read back through the archives, um, in addition to the stories that we have people from people and the, and the documentation. Um, so, it, but it was, it was an effective cover up. I mean, it was, it was so effective that, um, that Western countries who had diplomats on the ground telling them what was going on were confused by the story. And there was, for example, conversations in the British Foreign Office about well, you know, we have these reports from the ground, but Stalin isn't saying anything. Surely if there was a famine that bad, they would be asking for help, which they had done um, a decade earlier. Um, and so it, it confused, um, you know, the rest of Europe. Uh, it confused people who were, who were outside of Ukraine. And eventually it confused another generation of Ukrainians. I mean, it was a, it was a, a you know, profoundly successful. I mean, it was a little bit different from the way uh, disinformation works now. I mean, back then it was much easier to simply cut off information and then to, you know, threaten with arrest or punishment anybody who revealed it. Um, the techniques of modern disinformation are different. I, for example, um, what Putin does, uh, for example, following the downing of the uh, Malaysian airliner over eastern Ukraine, in 2014, he didn't sanction or arrest anybody who blamed it on Russia. He, he did what, as you described in your question, he put out masses of alternate theories and confusing explanations and so on. So the, the techniques of disinformation are different, but the instinct is very similar. You know, the, something embarrassing has happened. Um, it goes against the, um, the, the, the regime's, the, the picture of itself that the regime wants to sell to the world. Um, and so they will craft a massive state policy involving hundreds of people to stop it. So yes, I, I do think you can look at Soviet traditions of disinformation as a kind of you know, precursor to some of the techniques of disinformation that are used now. And it's really important to do so, not least because by doing so, you can also understand what's different about the present, you know, that it's not quite the same tactics, but even if some of the instincts are the same. And if I could just interject with a, with a comment first that uh, I had a, a, a unit at the at CIUS that researches the history of Ukrainians in Canada, and we've investigated or done a survey of the Canadian press during the famine years to see how much information there was. And you're right, there was a lot of information. What also becomes clear, though, is how quickly much of it got swept aside, even without use of disinformation. The rise of Nazism and Hitler in Germany diverted attention away from what was going on. People just moved on. Uh, and and I, this is, I mean, it's a tactic that many 
politicians still use. You just ride things out and hope that people, you know, other events will take overtake you and, and uh, people will be diverted. And in some ways, Hitler could be described as the greatest gift Stalin could ask for because the West became focused on the menace posed by Hitler right in the heart of, of, of Europe. What I want to ask, though, is about the whole question of radicalization. Now, you, we live in a society that's increasingly polarized. We have a problem with extremism, a growing problem with extremism. And you document how this extremism was inculcated in Soviet society. I'm wondering, what is there to learn from that experience, from how the Soviets managed to convince activists, ordinary people, to turn against their neighbors, to go into these villages and and do these horrible things. That is a it's a it's a very deep and very important story. And of course, it's not one that's unique to Ukraine, but there are, there is a there is a special Ukrainian version of it. Um, you know, when you look back at the at the history, the sort of the the, the ten or fifteen years building up to the famine, or really twenty years, um, you know, almost from the time real from the time of the revolution. In in any case, um, you do see the the construction of a narrative. Um, you know, that the revolution is, is moving forward, that, um, you know, that it will bring us all greater happiness and success, but it hasn't done so yet. And why not? What's standing in our way as a society? What's preventing us from progressing? And the answer, there were several different answers, but one of the answers, and the answer that became very important in Ukraine in the 1930s, was the peasantry, you know, the old fashioned backwards looking, um, um, caricatured peasantry are preventing the revolution from moving on. Um, and that, that idea that the peasants were somehow standing in the way of progress and they had to be wiped out or eliminated so that we could all move forward and, 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 and so that the revolution can succeed as, as they would. This was a narrative that, is, that lay very deep in in Bolshevik ideology. It's there from 1917, 1918, certainly from the time of the Civil War onwards. Um, and it, it, it sort of comes and goes a little bit. So in the 1920s, there's a, there's a, there's a as we know, there's a moment when the, there's, a, there's a little bit of relaxation of the policy towards the peasants in order to let them produce enough food so that the people can, um, can, can, can prosper a little bit at the end of that decade. And then it returns in the early 1930s. And it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's not that by itself, it's that narrative that we must get rid of this useless, um, you know, this class, obstructionist class of people. That plus, you know, bribes and gifts given to people who are willing to collaborate in eliminating that group, plus the fear that's created by the general atmosphere of violence. So, some people are, um, you know, some people are eager to, you know, to join the regime, even if it means, uh, you know, dispensing with their neighbors because they feel they feel it will bring them benefits. Um, all these combinations of different, um, you know, different kinds of motivations you can see acting on people um, in order to convince them to murder their neighbors. And it's important to remember for those who don't know the history of the famine that what the fam what caused the famine wasn't natural disaster and it wasn't drought. It was the actual removal of food from people. You know, so people, teams of, of collectors went from house to house and took people's food and not just grain, but eventually everything, you know, you know beans, vegetables, livestock, everything was removed from their house. And, and the, the activists who were doing this were sometimes people from Moscow or from Kharkiv, um, but sometimes they were also people's neighbors. And the, the ideology that enabled that was, as I say, this, 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 this progressive ideology or this, this uh, bull, bull, rather Bolshevik ideology, um, plus, you know, plus fear, hunger uh, and, and conformism added together. Um, and you know, this mechanism by which you convince one group of people that another group of people are standing in their way and preventing their society from achieving what it's supposed to achieve is something you can see, first of all, in, in other genocides. Um, and second of all, you can see a version of it in today's extremism. You know, what is the, um, you know, wh what's the problem with modern India? You know, it's the Muslims. You know, what's the problem with, um, with the Philippines? It's the drug dealers, you know. Um, you know, in the United States, you know, depending on, 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 on which group you're talking about, 
you know, what's 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 the problem with American cities? It's Antifa. It's some it's some it's some fanatics that need to be beaten up or pushed away. So the 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 use of this kind of language and and the scapegoating of people um, and the build up of certain groups as enemies of you know enemies of the nation or enemies of the people or enemies of the state. You know, these are very old tactics. Um, I mean, the Ukrainian famine story is one version of it, and I'm not, I, I wouldn't want to say that's what's happening exactly like that in our societies now. But it is amazing how, how some of these ideas repeat themselves. You know, you, if you focus on one particular social group and you caricature them as ugly or, or, or backwards or unnecessary, you know, you, you can inspire um, quite a lot of hatred. Um, you know, and you can also direct that hatred away from the government and the and its and its flaws and towards and towards specific enemies. And so, yeah, I think the Ukrainian famine again. It's a you can't read it as a as a, a direct analogy to anything that's happening now. But if you want to understand how extremism is deliberately created, then yes, it's a fantastic piece of history to study. <clears throat> Following up on that. Um, these themes that you're talking about, disinformation, radicalization, as you've said, we see the, see how they're playing out in today's context. Uh, I heard this anthropologist on the radio talking about what happens when discussing the consequences of erosion of trust in society. When people don't trust the media, they don't trust their politicians, they trust smaller and smaller groups. When, and finally, it comes down to, you probably had the same experience in this visiting the Soviet Union. People basically trusted close family and one or two friends. Um, I'm thinking about in context, what is the legacy of that? Do you see, what do you see as the connection between these issues that we've discussed so far and where Ukraine is now? We always see it inching, trying to move toward functioning democracy and taking two steps forward, one step back. Uh, how much, when you see it, do you see a direct line to the whole of the more? So there are a couple of interesting things in what you just said. I mean, one is this question of trust. And I think it's absolutely true that one of the things that authoritarians and totalitarians do is they break the sense of social trust. And it's when you break connections between people um, that that's when it's most easiest to rule over them, you know, because there are no, if there are no organic links between groups, then there can be no civil society, there can be no natural travel of ideas because people are afraid of one another. And that is exactly what life was like in the Soviet Union, that people were disconnected from one another and therefore atomized and therefore afraid and therefore isolated and therefore it was, it was easier to, to keep control of them. Um, and I think you can see in, um, you know, really in every post-Soviet state, you can see some leftovers and some, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 the long legacy, if you will, of this deep levels of distrust. Um, and in Ukraine, one of the sources of this, this distrust was the Holodomor and the memory of it. So, you know, the, the experience of having lived through the famine or having parents or grandparents who'd lived through it, and then the experience of not being able to talk about it or, speak about the dead or have communal rituals of memory um, is one of the th things that, that, that kept people apart. And it's one of the, you know, I think that even, it, it's not too big a stretch to say that even today, it's one of the sources of lack of trust in the government, in officials, in the state, um, is this feeling that, you know, we are, um, we Ukrainians are, you know, you know, we, you know, we talk to one another, we're good at creating organizations among ones, never, we never trust people. Um, who are in power. I mean, one of the paradoxes of Ukraine, I think, and one of the reasons why it's so hard to make a sweeping declaration about whether things are good or bad there, um, is, that, is that Ukrainians are unbelievably good at creating civic organizations and institutions. Um, and whether it's the, you know, the grand spectacle of the Maidan or even much more ordinary organizations that, that function all across the country, um, Ukrainians are rather good at working together and, and achieving things. Um, and they haven't been good at creating state institutions, you know, which have the backing of the rule of law and are sufficiently funded. Um, and very often the state institutions have become de facto privatized by oligarchs and taken over by, by, by different interest groups. But 
But the reason why it feels like one, two steps forward, one step back, or I don't know, one step forward, two steps back sometimes, yeah. is that you see this progress that, you know, things are, are pushed ahead by, by this very strong civil, civil society. Um, and then you see it pushed back against by, by people with, with, with money. I mean, the other issue in Ukraine, and this is something I've worked on separately from my, from my book on the whole of um, is that you have in different parts of the country, you have different historical memory. Um, and different ideas about what happened and therefore different ideas about who we are as a nation. Um, it seems to me that some of that is improving. Um, in the, in the, some of the polling and research I, I did together with a group that was looking at actually how to counter disinformation there. We find that um, especially people in the cities, including the Eastern cities and Southern cities, as well as the Western cities are beginning to converge and um, you know, not necessarily around the same, not everybody feels the same way about Stepan Bandera or the Second World War, but you can find other issues um, which they do converge around, whether it's memories of the 1990s or feelings about the independence movement or feelings about 2014. Um, and this, you know, this, this common sense of history and common experience, I think, is building a lot of cross-country trust among different parts of the society that were pretty isolated and, and had there were a lot of barriers between them in the past. So I, I feel that on this issue, you know, the question of trust and the question of um, the improvement of the state, that there is improvement and things are cha changing for the better. Although I know that it's very frustrating for Ukrainians, you know, who feel like it, nothing's ever happening quite fast enough. If I could just follow up on that. What we in our work at the Holdemar Research Education Consortium, yours, you'd probably agree with me, we sometimes encounter, uh, there are critiques of the emphasis on the Holodomor, that this is kind of a cult of victimhood, Ukraine should move on, it's not healthy for society to focus on this issue. Also, you know, you'll see an academic discussion uh, reducing the commemorations of the whole of the more to you know, you'll read something like you know former president Yushchenko uh, instrumentalized the whole of the more as as a uh, in, as a, a tool of nation building um, and I'm always surprised by that focus because it seems to me a legitimate um, initiative of society when it finally is able to to com commemorate something of 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 this magnitude uh, you know what. What would you say in response to those who think that, that there's too much emphasis on victimhood in, in focusing on these commemorations or that, for example, what we do, funding could be better spent on another topic, for example, why all this emphasis on the, on the whole of the more. And uh, this issue of politiz politization versus um, writing a historical wrong or, or finally addressing a historical wrong that was ignored? Um. No, I think it's not an accident that the first conversations, public conversations about the Holodomor began in the late 1980s, I mean, immediately following the Chernobyl disaster actually, um, and were, you know, and happened at the same time as the independence movement gained some ground. In Ukraine, they were, it was very intimately connected. The the story of the Holodomor, which was this repressed piece of history, you know, absolutely forbidden to, to discuss. You know, it's just not an accident that it was the first that you know, really almost the first thing that people wanted to talk about as soon as they could. And um, and it has a you know for that and for other reasons, not just because of the fact of it, not just because of the genocide, but because of the suppression of the truth. I think it's an event that will always play a special role in Ukrainian history. Um, and I should say again, in the in the polling that I'm aware of and the and the surveying I'm aware of, the Holodomor is in a country that is pretty divided by history, as I was saying in, in some ways. Um, the Holodomor is one of the things that people do have in common, and there is there is emerging a joint memory of it and a joint, um, you know, kind of a joint feeling about it. And, and the commemoration of it is fairly uncontroversial, you know, and again, there are more controversial points in Ukrainian history. Um, and this is not one of them anymore. Um, and so therefore, I, you know, I think that the time that has been spent on, I mean, it's not even just the commemoration, it's the writing of the history, the investment in memoir, um, the public, you know, the, 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 the immense publication of documents, 
Um, the, you know, the couple of films that have been made, some of which, some with Ukrainian, you know, both, both Ukrainian, Ukrainian, and also Ukrainian diaspora backing, including Mr. Jones. Um, I think these are, you know, I think this is really important, you know, important for the country to have that as a, as a kind of grounding story that, that, that everybody remembers. I don't think it should be the only story that people talk about, and I don't think it should be the only, you know, the only piece of history that Ukrainians have in common. I think there are, there, there are and should be many others that are, that are probably under discussed. Um, so, you know, so I'm, I would hope that the example that Marta, that your group and others have shown about how you can explore, portray, discuss, explain this piece of history will be one that is taken up you know, by others working on working on other topics. Um, I mean, you know, there is something that's happened, I think, since 2014, which, which is that um, it's not so much that the Holodomor is less important, it's just as important as it was, but the, the question of Ukrainian nationhood and the argument about, you know, what makes us a nation has moved on a little bit from Soviet times and even from the post-Soviet era. And since the Maidan, it's just become more sophisticated and complicated. Um, so there's more there's more to discuss than than the Holodomor. It's true, but you know, you, you know th that's also true. You could also say of the state of Israel that it's also moved on in many ways from the Holocaust and the definition of what is Israel and who are we and how do we come together is now much broader and wider. But that doesn't mean you stop talking about the Holocaust. Um, so I think that the there's a there's a role for education investigation. Um, and research into the Holodomor that, you know, that, that could go on, I mean, forever really, because every generation will want to reinterpret it and rethink it and look at the documents again and reread them. Just like we read, you know, we're going to reread histories of the First World War or the Second World War or, you know, the, the, the Bolshevik Civil War, you know, for the next hundred years or more. Um, you know, you know, but I think both things can be true. I think it can be true that we need to continue studying it and researching it and thinking about it. And we also need, you know, Ukraine also needs a broad national conversation about, about the nature of the, of the nation and of the state. But I think, I think both are happening. So, um, so I don't see any contradiction there. And you're absolutely right. Uh, the more time that goes on since we began this, this intense study of the whole, the more I'm, I'm, always surprised by how it's relevant to different disciplines. Someone studying the history of medicine in the Soviet Union. Well, you can't really talk about that with what did the medical profession do during the 30s? How did it react to this famine? Somebody else is studying the role of, of how the Soviet system used students in various ways. And then there's a chapter on how they were used during collectivization in the whole of the more so that it informs having this base of research on the whole of the more is now informing all these other areas of research. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, the, the, you know, the also studying the whole of the more can contribute to other, you know, other, you know, other areas of study, even outside of the Soviet Union. So as you know, one of the women who I worked with on my, on my book, um, on my book about the Holodomor, Daria Mattingly um, has written her PhD on the study of perpetrators and the motivations of perpetrators and, and then the children and grandchildren of perpetrators. And, and, and I think her work will contribute more broadly to the study of genocide. I mean, it will, be, it will eventually be part of a you know, big canon of research on, on, on those issues. So, I mean, look like any big and understudied historical event um, the, the more research that's done on the Holodomor, the, the more granular it will become and the more it will contribute to other, other stories, whether it's, as you say, the story of Soviet medicine or the story of Soviet agriculture or the story of, you know, the history of Soviet disinformation. You forget, of course, uh, Soviet women and uh, Daria yeah. has written about uh, the role yes. that women played in the Holodomor. Yes. I, um, I just wanted to comment about the whole question of politicization because this seems to be a a fallback position in parts of academia that uh, initially uh, you know, there was a skepticism to the stories of the whole Demar. Well, these are emigres. This is exaggerated. This is these are nationalists. Uh, that was used to downplay it, dismiss it, and whatever. Now the the argument seems to be in some circles, anyways, that it's overly politicized. And it strikes me as a strange argument because 
the whole of the war was a political act. It was the result of political decisions, political policies that were implemented. Everything about it was political when it was happening. And then the post whole of the war cover up, all of that, that that's all political. I don't think you can avoid politics in this. And so I just find it a, a baseless argument. Uh, I was just going to, I'm curious to know about the reception of your book that it's received in academic circles. Uh, could you share with us some of your experiences? It's been translated into how many languages now? Do you know, or? I, I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know. I would say at least 20. Wow. I mean, wow. so it's having, <laughs> it's, it's having a huge impact, uh, uh, a wide impact uh, around the world actually. Uh, but uh, I'm just, uh, could you just comment a bit about some of the uh, responses that you've had to your book and uh, how people have, uh, how it's been reviewed and, and commented on? So I've had, one of the things that has surprised me about my book was how positive most of the reviews and commentary were. I expected much more pushback, um, whether from academics or from, um, you know, frankly, from Russia or, or, or people close to Russia and, you know, Russian views of history. Um, and there was much less of that than I thought there would be. Um, and, you know, for the most part, for, even from, from, sorry, from people who study the history of the Soviet Union or the history of Russia, most, most of the reaction was, oh, how useful someone's finally gone into this subject. You know, it's now all been laid out for me and now I understand it better. And it's, you know, it fits into a, it fits into a bigger story of the Soviet, you know, of course there's a wider story of the Soviet famine, um, which is also told and, and people have found it a useful addition to that story. I mean, the only one or two negative, um, you know, there, there's, there are some historians of the Soviet Union who see the story from the point of view of Moscow and don't ever want to look at it from the other side or don't, aren't, interest, aren't very interested in the archives of the Ukrainian Communist Party um, or who find the, you know, who, who, are, who, who are so gripped by the, by the genuinely gripping and actually genuinely compelling story of Stalin and the people around him and the, the mechanism of power in Moscow that they find the, you know, the Ukrainian famine, that kind of secondary story, so they're not very interested in it. Um, and, you know, to them, I don't know what to say. I mean, you know, to each his own. I mean, that you, you, can, you, can um, you, you can also find Moscow, the stories of, you know, infighting in Moscow, pretty provincial as well. Um, so, but I haven't had, I mean, one or two bad reviews, one or two academics who didn't like it. There's, there's one academic in, in Virginia who has a completely different theory about how the famine happened and he didn't, but although, which I didn't entirely understand, but, but no, I, mo mostly I found that, um, you know, in, you know, for, it's a book that is written for ordinary readers. It's meant to be accessible to people who aren't academic historians. Um, and I've found that it is. Um, and so people have told me, um, people who don't normally read this kind of history book or don't read, uh, don't know much Soviet history have found it useful as a backdrop, you know, to, in order to understand the modern history of Ukraine. Um, and I found most academics, um, including some who used to be hostile to, to, to Ukrainian or national, you know, kind of, you know, these national nuances in the story of the Soviet Union, I found it to be, I found them to be surprisingly open to it. Um, you know, you know, there's a very famous academic called Sheila Fitzpatrick, um, who disagreed with some things about the book. She's a historic, historically a skeptic of the story of the Ukrainian famine, who wrote actually a surprisingly friendly review. I mean, she doesn't, she didn't like me very much for a variety of reasons, and, you know, fair enough. Um, but she didn't dismiss the main thesis and she, and, you know, she indicated that this was a legitimate way to, to see that piece of history. So I really, I haven't had any, um, I haven't had any serious pushback um, in, in academia that really worried me. And I've had mostly positive feedback from, from sort of, from the ordinary people or the, 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 the educated readers um, for, whom, for whom the book was written including in Ukraine. And, and we talked maybe, I don't know, a year ago about the reception and what your hopes were for the impact of the book. And I was looking this week, uh, you'll, you'll be pleased to know, I see it in many more syllabi than, uh, university syllabi than a year ago. So it, it is having that impact. But I also had 
an email this morning I'd written to her to our colleague Ludmila Hrnevich, who's a leading researcher of the whole of more in Ukraine. And she says by January, the Russian translation will be, as she said, wrote, freely available. So uh, this is kind of a long time coming that the Russian translation be maybe the last. What's your hope for what the impact of red famine in Russian might be? So, I mean, you know, maybe then I'll finally get some more pushback from the Russians, which I, as I, there's been a little bit, and in fact, I detected a little bit of it after the Ukrainian publication. Um, but, you know, maybe there'll be a bit of pushback, but I, I would hope that open-minded Russians, and there are a lot of them, you know, that open-minded Russians and would, would, would read the book and would have an insight into the history of modern Ukraine and some explanation for why Ukraine is in some ways different, is different from Russia. Um, you know, this was for a lot of Russians who were brought up to think that Ukraine was a kind of suburb of Russia or a, an appendage of Russia. You know, it will, be, it will be, you know, a revelation to see how the history of communism played out differently in Russia and in Ukraine. And, um, you know, and of course, they're, they are the same in many ways. Um, and then there are these, these nuances and differences. So I'm hoping that it will, it will do what it did in Russia for, for people reading it in English. Namely, it will give you the background to modern Ukrainian history that you don't have. I mean, we want, it's not the only background, um, but it's one piece of the story that you know, nobody studied this in school. Nobody had it. You know, most people didn't even have it as part of their Soviet history course that they did in college. Because um, so little was known about it ten years ago, um, and so I, you know, I hope it'll it will feel to people like a missing piece of the story, and I believe that to a lot of Russians it will it will be useful. And of course, the other big audience um, is Russian speakers in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of one of the things that outsiders, and you both know this, of course, um, but but not everybody knows. One of the people that outsiders don't realize about Ukraine is that Ukraine is a bilingual country. Um, and there are Ukrainian speaking Ukrainians and there are Russian speaking Ukrainians. Um, and the fact that they're Russian speaking Ukrainians doesn't mean they're Russians. You know, they, they identify as Ukrainians. Um, and we've, we've seen that, you know, and it's becoming even more true as time goes on. Um, but not all of them read Ukrainian well, um, or, they, or it's not their first language. So, you know, so even though they speak Ukrainian, they prefer to read in Russian. And so I'm hoping that this book will also be useful to them. Again, it's a it's a it's a story that they will know in its essence, but you know, but they won't necessarily know all the details and, and you know, or have the you know, I, I, I lay out some of the archival, um, some of the archival findings of the last decade, and I'm hoping that they will find it useful too. I mean, so they are another another big reason why it's being printed in Russian is for them. Mm -hmm. It's encouraging to to hear about the positive overall positive uh, reception uh, of Red Famine. Uh, obviously, there's been a change of, in mentality and people and uh, people are more open to hearing even about it. Uh, at the same time, you still get these pockets of um, famine deniers, much like Holocaust deniers. So I'm always amazed that with all the information that's out there, uh, that there's still people who uh, say it was a hoax. It was something that German propaganda created uh, uh, and, and immediately try to change the subject to something else, particularly the Second World War. So... Uh, I don't suppose that it'll ever be possible to totally extinguish these little backwaters, but uh, they're there. And, and one of the reasons we're talking with you today is because we had a, a precisely that kind of an incident at the University of Alberta, where somebody who's not a specialist in his, is not a historian, uh, is not a specialist in Eastern Europe or anything like that, uh, produced a series of blogs where he basically dismissed the famine as a German hoax. I mean, that's a very, very old story, you know, going back to, um, you know, going back to the, to, the, to the Soviet era, dismissing it as a German hoax. And there was even, as you, as you know, but probably not all the people watching this know, there was even a, the, in the 1980s when Robert Conquest wrote the first um, big investigation of the famine, of the, you know, uh, of the famine in English, um, the Soviet Union actually invested in the production of a book um, published in Canada um, that was ex exactly this thesis, namely that it was a that it was a hoax, or that it was exaggerated, or that it was a and you know and specifically that it was a a German story. I mean, one of the you know there are many complicated aspects of the historiography of the famine. One of them is that um, the Soviet Union covered it up, of course, as we as we discussed, 
um, during the Nazi occupation of Ukraine, during the Second World War, that was one of the first times that it became possible to discuss it publicly. So the Nazis did publicize the famine, uh, you know, in a way that Stalin hadn't. Um, and so some of the material about the famine that made it eventually to the West in the 1940s uh, and 1950s, you know, had some, you know, was, was material that appeared or was published or was dug out during the, during the Nazi occupation, because that's just, that was just the nature of the Second World War. And I think that's probably the, the, the original origin of the, of the myth. Um, but, you know, you don't have to, you know, you know, the city, you know you don't have to even believe me. I mean, for the last, you know, it seems to be the real change in understanding of the famine and the real reason I think why my book got relatively good or positive reception was that the thing that has changed over the last several decades um, is not even so much that we know more history, although we do, we've the, mostly thanks to the Ukrainian historians who've dug it out, but also the status of Ukraine is different. And now that it has its, it, now that it's an independent country, it has its own politics, which are different from Russia's. Um, it has its own, you know, it produces its own historians and its own, you know, cultural products and its own filmmakers, uh, and, and, you know, and so on. Um, you know, people simply take more seriously the material that is produced because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem like it's coming from nowhere, or as you say, it's a bunch of emigres or it's you know, people who live outside the country talking about stuff. It's actually, you know, we, there is a Ukrainian national archive and there's a, and there's a, you know, distinguished head of it. And he has distinguished people working with him and they are, there's a whole apparatus of credible researchers, um, monographs, books, um, you know, archival material being, being, being produced. Um, and so the, you know, the argument, you know, talking now as if there, there's nothing but a German hoax is almost like a throwback. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, maybe you could have gotten away with saying that in the night, you know, in 1943. Um, but you really, now it just makes you look silly and obscure. I mean, it's a, I mean, and you're right, it is like, it's as if you were denying the Holocaust. I mean, there's a whole body of material. There is, you know, there are, there are layers of academics who've worked on it. There are, you know, there are American and Italian um, and other researchers who've invested in the story, not just Ukrainians. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know, it's a, I mean, the only, the only explanation I can have for why this kind of thing persists is that, as you say, it's not that different from why the Holocaust denialism persists. You know, it's useful for, you know, for some people to, um, to live on the academic fringes, or it's you know it's got shock value to say something that's wrong, or it you know it, it makes you part of some you know gives you access to some extreme I don't know you know ideological groupings in academia I don't know I can't I can't I don't want to put any uh, motives and in, in, you know make up invent motives for people, but I mean it is um, it is a um, you know it is a it is a phenomenon that is parallel to the other kinds of disinformation that we see moving around. I mean, there's, there's no, um, you know, there's no basis anymore for this kind of story and it's, um, it's time to move on. And I, I would just add, it, it gets lost in, in, it got lost during what we've already been discussing, the disinformation, but that Russians themselves at the time, it surprised me the degree to which they called this, um, a Ukrainian famine. Not only was there discussion in the Russian emigre press of a famine going on in the Soviet Union, but it was called a Ukrainian famine. People on trains and traveling Russians uh, identified this as something that was happening specifically in Ukraine. And that's been and forgotten. Be, yeah, I mean, to be clear, there was a Soviet famine yeah. I talked about in the yeah. book. And there was a period of hunger that affected all of the grain producing and even non-grain producing parts yeah. of the Soviet Union. And the argument, the thesis of my book is that within this general story of the famine, um, the Ukrainian famine is a subset of that story. So Stalin used this moment when there was chaos all over the country to get rid of what was for him a problem. And this was the problem of the national movement in Ukraine as well as the Ukrainian Communist Party, which was very independent of the Soviet Communist Party. And so he made use of the, of the general chaos to solve this particular problem 
problem. And so there, it's a kind of famine within a famine. I mean, just in the same way that you can talk about the atrocities committed by Hitler in the Second World War, by which you mean he murdered gypsies and he murdered, you know, Poles and he murdered Balts. And, and you know, and you can talk about within that big category, you can talk about the Holocaust as something separate. I think that that's how I speak about the Ukrainian famine as a, as a specific action that was taken for specific local reasons um, at, you know, as a way of benefiting from the more general Soviet famine. And then you spent years thinking about this, researching it, and then the book get, gets published and you move on. Are there times that it still comes to mind? What kind of things trigger you to think about something that you spent so much time studying and now have moved on from besides a conversation like this? Well, I mean, even current events kind of make you move on nowadays. I mean, you know, yeah. even if I wanted to think about nothing but the Ukrainian famine, I would be, would be impossible yeah. um, given what's given what's happening, happening in the world. But look, I, I find the study of the famine unbelievably useful for all the issues that we've just been discussing. I find it really useful for understanding modern disinformation and for the mentality created by, by disinformation and the mentality that wants to create it. I found it useful for understanding the human instinct to scapegoat and to identify enemies and, to, and, the, and the political tools that can be used to create enemies. Um, I find it really useful background for understanding modern Russia and modern Ukraine. Um, what is what is Putin's attitude to Ukraine? Why is he so paranoid about Ukraine? Um, you know, there, there's a lot, if you go back in history and look at why was Stalin so paranoid about Ukraine, the, the anxiety that Ukraine creates for Russia, um, both because it's, because it's so similar in many ways, because it's culturally so closely related, because there's so many people intermarried, because, the, um, you know, because uh, you know, there's so much shared history, um, the, the closeness of Ukraine to Russia, and at the same time, Ukraine's slightly different orientation, its connections to Poland, its connections to, the, to Europe, um, are, are a source of anxiety to Moscow. And they are now, and they were 100 years ago. Um, and so I find the, the, the study of the famine really helps me make sense of, of modern geopolitics. And it, it really comes back to me all the time. Could I maybe... Um start to wrap up our conversation with a question about uh, your future plans. Red Famine is your third book about the Soviet Union. Is there a fourth book somewhere down the in, in thing? Maybe the colored revolutions or some aspect of Soviet uh, history, uh, Soviet society that you would like to explore perhaps in the future? So one thing is for certain, and that is I don't wanna write about Stalin anymore. Um, <laughs> I spent a long time with him. I read many of his letters, you know, his letters to Kaganovich, you know, his, I spent a long time thinking about him and that's enough. So I, I, I the, the Red Famine in that sense almost did me in. I mean, I, I, it was a, it's a very tough story. Um, there's very little that is redeeming or uplifting in the story of millions of people being starved to death. And it was a very difficult book for me to write um, in, in that sense. Um, I, I, I am doing a lot of journalism right now and also a lot of thinking about democracy and what democracy means and how it's how it can or can't be an answer to some of the some of the questions that we've just been discussing. Um, but in due course, at least as soon as we can get back into archives and do interviews again, I hope I'm hoping that'll be sometime in the next year or so. Um, I, I do want to write a book about 1989 and the 1990s. Um, and so the end, the period of the end of the the Soviet Union and the launch of democracy and the, or the attempts to create democracy in, in, in Eastern Europe. And, and Ukraine will be a part of that story. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Anne, for uh, taking part in our conversation with you today and for the book. It's a marvelous book and uh, you're absolutely right. It's written for a general reader. Uh, I'm amazed at how you've been able to take this massive information and synthesize it and explain things at a micro level and at a macro level in a very, very readable way. So I think that uh, it's, a, it's been a huge success and for very good reason. And I look forward to reading more of your books uh, going forward.
Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you had the time to, to dedicate to, the, the, to this discussion. And I hope people find it useful. The Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies has for decades been engaged in commissioning and publishing scholarly investigations of the genocidal famine or great hunger of 1932-1933. Over the years, CIUS has been responsible for producing and disseminating numerous works on the subject of the Holodomor, including book-length studies by historians, archival collections, journal essays, and conference proceedings. These can be obtained from CIUS Press. For more information about the famine, visit the website of the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium at holodomor.ca. And if you don't yet have a copy of Anne, Apple's bomb, Anne Applebaum's book, you can order it through your local bookseller or an online retailer. Other books by Anne that may be of interest to you include Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944 to 1956, Gulag, A History, and Between East and West Across the Borderlands of Europe. This concludes our conversation with Anne Applebaum, author of Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine. Thank you for joining us today, and please let friends know that it is now possible to access our discussion on YouTube and through the website of the Canadian Study Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta.